want me to do? Oh, we need to be in the front. We need to be in the front. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Extension Office. Uh, just a little reminder, I want to introduce ourselves first. My name is Sarah Smith, and I am the co-chair of the propagation team for the Master Gardeners. This is Catherine Hamilton. She is our resident expert in year-round gardening in North Carolina. And this is Bev Tishy, and she is the chair for our seed starting committee. And at this time, I want, would like to remind everybody to turn your phones on, vibrate, or turn them off. And then this class, oh, I'll also point out that we're ha this is information about the two plant sales that are coming up. So once you get finished with this class, you're going to want to go to the plant sales. <laughs> um, this class is under the Bull City Gardener series that we put, that the Master Gardeners put out. Uh, and if you want more information on other classes, you can just Google Bull City Gardener. And Ashley will actually uh, email you the link to the, that calendar when she emails uh, this video. We are having it video today. So, why are we having a class in the middle of January on seed starting? Well, for one thing, um, the month of January is traditionally the time when you sharpen your tools, you clean up the dead stuff, and it's also the month when you start planting. Now, if you're like me, you've got a stack like this of, calendar, of seed catalogs, right? Everybody? Oh, yeah. I have them right next to it, up on the dining room table so I can look at them while I'm eating. Um, but in North Carolina, it's really important since we can garden year round, it's very important for us to have a plan, especially since if we have limited space, which most of us do. Um, so we need to know what, seed, what plants are going in bed, which plants are coming out of a bed. But why should we garden? Just because we can garden year round in North Carolina, why should we? I mean, even gardeners need a, a break once in a while, right? No. <laughs> okay, I didn't expect that. Um, there is, there are good reasons to garden year round. It's, it's good for us, be, and it's good for the plants, and it's also good for the soil life. It's good for us because we get vegetables and flowers year round, um, and we also use this time of the year to get a head start on to start some of the plants that we really like that are tropical. And tropical plants need a very long time from the time they germinate to the time they put flowers or fruit out. And we have a lot of tropical plants that we like, like tomatoes are tropical, impatiens are tropical. And if we waited until the last frost date to plant seeds outdoors, uh, and, and patients, they would be killed by the first frost date before they even flowered. So this is a good time for us to start seed, uh, start different kinds of seed. It's good for the plants, and there are some plants like tomatoes and impatiens that won't grow during the winter time. And the, the, the opposite is true. There are some plants that won't grow during the hot time. Uh, for example, cabbages. Now, cabbages will grow during the hot season, but what they're going to do in their growth pattern is they're going to sit bolt. They're going to send up a flower stalk, make seeds, and that'll be the end of them. So it's better for us to grow them during the cool season to keep that from happening so we can have lots and lots of weeds. It's also good for the soil life. Uh, when I first started raise, uh, gardening and raised beds, my first year of gardening and raised beds, the, my plants were just you know big and luscious and I was just going, yes, I'm a master gardener, I can do this. <laughs> Second year, okay, you know, they're edible, they're a little small, but you know, that's okay. Third year, they were just anemic. They, they had light green leaves, and I looked at everybody else's, and they were like twice as big as my plant and dark green. And I couldn't figure out what it was. Now, I already knew that the soil life, the, the bacteria and the fungi in the soil fed my plants. They, what they do is they break down things that are rotting, into a, a form that the plants can actually uptake. I didn't know that this is a two-way exchange. Plants send sugars and, and starches down into their roots 
to actually feed the soil biome. And so what I was doing when I got finished with my bed, I'd just cover it over and leave it dormant until I decided I wanted to use it again. So every year, my soil biome was diminishing. Good news, it takes very little time for it to come right back, but you need to keep living roots in the ground all the time to feed that soil biome. So in this class, this is a, 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 a unique class because what we're going to do, we're gonna give you a little bit of science. I'm gonna talk about how seed, seeds work. And the reason for that is it, I can teach you how to do something, but if I teach you why it works, it makes a whole lot more sense to you. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about creating a plan for year-round gardening. And then I'm going to turn it over to Catherine who is going to talk about the three seasons that we have in North Carolina and the plants, the wonderful plants that we can turn, come in and out of our garden. And then we're gonna take a short break and when we come back, Beverly is going to demonstrate how to plant seeds. So, let's get started. Now, plants were here a long time before humans were here, and they are excellent propagators. They propagate themselves, have been from the very beginning. They're so good at propagating that they have managed to cover the entire globe. We have plants that are in the depths of the ocean all the way up to a rocky crag on the highest mountain. We have plants in the swamp. We have plants in the desert. These guys know how to propagate themselves. Now, one of the things that, that they, when they first started out, in the, they were vegetative, which meant that you know, they were moving by rhizomes and suckers, and they were also spreading spores, uh, which are little single cellular um, pieces of, of plant material. And keep that in mind, that'll come up later on. Um, and that worked, and plants still do that today. Mother Nature just loves to experiment. Mother Nature will experiment with just about anything. So about 300 million years ago, mother insects were coming on, and Mother Nature said, oh, let's take advantage of this. Let's make seeds. And the first plants that were seed-bearing plants were gymnosperms. And they, gymno means naked, and sperm means seed. So these were naked seeds. In other words, they didn't have any fruit around them. Um, and the modern day plant, plants that still exist are the cycads, the conifers, and the ginkgos. In other words, they're the cone-bearing plants. So if you see a pine cone, then the seeds that are inside of it are naked seeds. There's just the seed, there's no fruit around it. And then around 146 million years ago, we came out with angiosperms, and angiosperms are seeds that are encased in a nice, tasty little packet to entice us to go to come and get them. And the seed-bearing plants were, are so the seed is such a good innovation that about to this today around 90% of all of our plants are angiosperms. So what exactly is a seed? If you will take a look at your lima bean. Now, if we were to describe this lima bean to somebody that wasn't a gardener, they would say, well, it looks like a rock, it, but it's light, um, could be a chip of wood, um, could be made out of cardboard. It kind of has that feel of cardboard. But none of this is true. This is a protective little packet that contains a living plant embryo. It is the bridge between all the ancestors that came before and all the descendants that are gonna come afterwards. It is, uh, it has in it, with the embryo, it has a packet of food that is going to sustain that seedling until it gets high enough and big enough to grow true leaves, what we call true leaves, and start to photosynthesize and make its own food. So this thing is the innovation that, that has just about transformed the plant world. There's got to be a reason. There there's always has to be an advantage for something to last. And the advantages for plants is that one of the things this little packet does is it keeps the seeds from drying out. Now, with the spores, the, 
and I should have should know more about this, but I have I have very little. But with spores, they fall on the ground, so they're limited to how far the wind will carry them. They drop to the ground, and then they don't have an embryo. In order to form an embryo, the sperm from one spore has to swim in water to the to the ovary on another spore. That's correct. So number one, they're limited by the wind. They're limited by the fact that they've got to have water that they fall into. If they fall into dry, they're dead, they're gone. Number three, their embryo is created out in the open with no protection. So if anything in the environment is wrong, that embryo's gone. Here we have it, we have this little seed. And one of the things is, is that it's des desiccant resistant. In other words, it can sit here and, and make, remember it's got its food storage. Uh, so if it's dry and there's no moisture, the seed can sit and wait for a while. And some of them can wait for many years, like weed seeds. <laughs> um, it, because it's multicellular, it has more resources than the single cellular one. Uh, it can delay its germination until the environment is absolutely ideal to support the seedling. We get a lot of genetic diversity with seeds, a lot more than we do with the single cell spores. And dispersal, some seeds still use wind because it was a good idea, so they still use wind. But then, but seeds that, that are in a packet like this, they have insects, they have birds, they have water, they have animals, and they have humans. And we are the biggest Dispr seed dispersal mechanism right now on the planet Earth. We will carry seeds all the way around the globe. Nothing stops us. <laughs> so we also have to be motivated. So what are the advantages to us for starting seeds? Well, the first one is varieties. If you go to the nurse, a nursery or if you go to a big box store and you're wanting to buy a, a tomato plant, you're going to have a choice of a few tomato plants that were picked out for you by the store buyer. If you go to the seed catalogs, Catherine, what was the name of that seed catalog? Um, well, there's two, tomato growers. Tomato growers. And um, they were free because they had free shipping. Yeah, <laughs> so if you go to a seed catalog and you're going to find out this out if you ever start uh, wanting to find tomatoes, you have a massive variety to choose from. It becomes your choice what kind of variety that you're going to, to grow. It's also economical. I can take my $4 and go to a, a nursery and I can buy one plant. I can also take that $4 and go to a seed company, especially Baker Creek with free shipping, and buy 100 seeds. It's fun because we are, help, we are participating in one of nature's methods. Um, and the timing has to be right and that's in North Carolina since we can t grow year round. We have to know what plants to grow, what time. So let's talk a little bit, I'm gonna get sciency on you here. Seed germination <laughs> is all about, it, it's, it is, is um, engined by hormones and the three major hormones is gibberellins, abscisic acid and cytokinins. And gibberellins are the main one that when it gets moisture in, in the seed, it activates the gibberellins. And the gibberellins start this cell division and multiplication, and it's when the seed swells and the, and the embryo starts to grow and put out a root. Well, if that happened while this little seed was right on the, on the plant, what you're going to have is you're gonna have the seedlings sitting out in the middle of the environment, in the middle of air, wind, and, and dry out. It's not gonna work. So there's an abscisic acid that keeps the gibberellin intact. Just because it's raining on the, on the black beans doesn't mean it's time for you to germinate. And then once the seed detaches from the plant and falls to the ground, there's cytokinins that override the abscisic acid and, the, and once that abscisic acid is overwritten, the gibberellins can do their part. And that's all the sciencey stuff you're gonna get in this class. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, I couldn't resist. The, the cytokinins, what role do they play exactly in the cell? Do they help protect the plant from predators or anything like that? Um, that I would have to look up, okay. yeah.
getting ahead of myself. And just if, if we're curious, the cytokines are primarily cell division, um, so okay. they're the ones that really promote. So they have all these different roles, but they're primarily cell division. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, so what starts this chain reaction with all these hormones are, is the environment, and that's where we come in because we can uh, manipulate the environment in order to start this chain reaction. And the three main things in the environment are temperature, light, and moisture. And temperature is probably the most important. Every single seed species has a ideal germination temperature range. Now, as far as light is concerned, for the most part, any seed will, will germinate, whether it's under the lights or whether it's in the dark. Once, it, once they do germinate, they immediately have to go under the light. But there are a few seeds that have to either have light or have dark in order to germinate. And a, an example of a seed that has to have light would be the bird's nest fern. And bird's nest ferns live high up in the canopy of the trees. So if their seeds fall on the, on the forest floor, they're not gonna germinate because they know that they're not in the right environment. Well, they don't know it, but they won't germinate in the dark. Um, another plant that needs light is swamp plants. Now, swamp plants grow on the forest floor, but in order to germinate, they need to germinate when the canopy is bare. So they're programmed to start germination when there's light hitting the forest floor. Some light inhibited species are plants like a desert plant that doesn't get a whole lot of water, so the, the seed drops, it buries into the ground deep enough so that it's dark. And there's a, at the microscopic level or at this, the level of a seed, there's a lot of light that comes through sand, that shines through sand. So they've gotta get deep enough so that the light doesn't come through. That seed can sit there protected and just as happy as can be until the rains come and enough rain that will soak through the sand to get to that seed. Once that happens, that seed will germinate because it knows that the environment is correct to support that seedling. And a lot of our flower crops are, plant, are seeds that need to be in lights, in, in dark. So whenever you get ready to start your seeds, just keep that in mind to make sure that they don't have that special um, uh, need. Now moisture, uh, and like I said, there's two things that a seed needs in order to germinate, and that's moisture and that's light. So those are the two things that a seed needs to germinate. It doesn't need soil. If any of you guys have had grown sprouts or microgreens, you know that the soil is, is, an op is optional until it gets bigger. But in storage, moisture really comes into play. There's, there's two types of seeds. There's recalcitrant and there is orthodox. And recalcitrant seeds are seeds that cannot stand to be dried out. If they're dried out, they're gone. And a good example of this is our native pawpaw trees. Their seeds are recalcitrant seeds. They have to stay moist until they're in the ground. So if you want to save them, you need to wrap them up in moist, uh, moist paper towel and stick them in like a Ziploc bag. And then you can put them in the refrigerator and keep them for up to two years. They'll be fine. The other, the vast majority of our seeds are orthodox seeds, and they can stand to be dried out down to 10% of their water level, 10%. And at that low level, they can be frozen. And so these big seed banks that you hear about, like the one in Svalbard, all the seeds that they have in there are orthodox seeds because they will dry them down to the 10%, and then they freeze them. And each of those things above are, that's information that you're going to need when you start doing your plan for the year-round gardening. Um, if you're like I am, I cannot keep in my head all the information about all the different plants that I deal with. And I have 15 beds, so I really need to know what's gonna go in and what's gonna come out. So I'm gonna talk to now about developing a plan. So the first, there's, there's three components to, be, to developing a plan, and the first one is the format. Um, and the format, when I, when I tell people to start developing the plan, I say to you, do what, is, what you can do. Do what is the way the 
style that you want, and there are a million of them. I use a spreadsheet because I find that's more, most comfortable for me. Actually, I use several spreadsheets that are in one workbook, but you know, we'll get to that. Um, I've also seen people that use a notebook. There was one guy that used, that had a notebook and he had it divided into months. And so he knew each month what was going to go in and where it was going to go. And then the next month, uh, it just went right through when it was gonna go in, when it was gonna come out. And one of our master gardeners, Lise Jenkins, had used a photo album. And what she did is where the little packets where the photos go, she would put the seed packet in that photo album along with an index card. And so if she wanted to do consecutive plantings, that seed packet would just move along with, with the months in, in her uh, photo album. Uh, you can also use a database if you want to. I had a database in my computer crash, so I'm gonna do that with a caveat. Um, you can use, uh, you can draw out a plat of your garden and superimpose different, for each year, superimpose a plan for it. Um, you can use a commercial garden planner if you want. So anything that feels comfortable for you, uh, go ahead and do. Now I will, at this point, I'm going to plug using a garden, a garden journal, a journal, a gardening journal. I was a holdout for many years about that gardening journal because I just thought, oh, this is one more thing I have to do in all of this. But I have found that it is probably one of the best tools I have as far as planning because I can go back and get the information that I need from the year before. I know that the packet says, okay, it's going to germinate, it's going to take this long before I have to harvest. And I can say to myself, well, in my yard, it, I harvested it two weeks later. So it gives you this little picture of your microclimate, of your local um, gardening area. And it also reminds you that, yes, celebrity is a good tomato and it's really touted, but you didn't really care for the taste of it. So don't, don't do it again. <laughs> space and beds is, space is one thing that that when you're year-round gardening, and, and Catherine will get all, and into this a whole lot more as far as the s spacing um, beds, you're going to want to know what, like I said, what goes in and what comes out. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say about that because my, I, have, I have names for my gardens and then in my vegetable garden, I have numbers for my beds. But it comes very in very handy when I'm doing my soil test because you're gonna to have to write the name of your vegetable or your name of your garden and what you're testing your soil in on that box. So if they're already named, it really helps. So the majority of the information that you're going to need for creating the plan is information about your plants. And you're gonna know, you're gonna to have to know when and where to start them. And what I mean by that is what time of the year are you going to start them? and whether you're going to start them indoors or whether you're going to start them outdoors. You're also going to need to know the days to germination. <laughs> when I first planted my carrots, I was really excited. I just thought, you know, I'm really a vegetable gardener now because I'm planting carrots. I planted, I made my bed, I planted my carrots, I'd water them in and every day I'd go out and I would look and there'd be bare ground. And I'd say, okay, you know, day after day, bare ground, bare ground. Two weeks later, I finally said, I give up. They were bad seed, I did something wrong, they are not going to germinate. So I replanted that entire bed. A week later, carrots. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say that days to germination is very important for one, for at least one thing, and that is to find out whether or not your seeds actually are um, not, not germinating. Uh, the next day it, thing is days to transplant. It, and this, this goes with pe seeds that you're gonna plant indoors. Most of the seeds that you start indoors are going to go out after our last frost date. If you're really excited about planting, you will do it on April the 16th, which is when I do them, and then I end up covering everything I have because there's gonna be a freeze. Uh, No. <laughs> uh, there, because there's going to be
be a freeze. Now, there are some people that take into account that there's going to be a freeze, so they won't transplant their plants until the, until the first of May or even later. Um, so it's just what you're comfortable with. And the next thing then, I'm gonna go refer to my things here. Okay, days to, and weeks to harvest. One of the things that you really need to pay attention to, on the seed packet it's going to say days to harvest. And what the seed packet means is like a tomato. It means how many days you're gonna have to wait from the time you transplant that plant till you get your first tomato. For planning purposes, days to harvest means how many, how, when are you going to cut that plant off and get it out of the bed? So just keep that in mind. And I usually uh, do my, my harvest um, in weeks to harvest because it makes it easier for me. But like I said, find the format that works for you. Uh, another thing about harvest, weeks to harvest, when you're trying to figure that out, it starts when that plant goes in the ground outside. So if you're going to plant seeds outside, it'll start then. If you've started them inside and you're transplanting them outside, it starts when you put them in the ground outside. So that's when you're calculating your, your weeks to harvest, you wanna start when that plant goes in the ground outside, whether it goes in as a transplant or a seed. And so another part of the information is you're, you're going to know, uh, want to know about the plant's light preferences or requirements. And I, I love this one. I, I've always grown tomatoes, and I knew tomatoes were a tropical plant. So sun, right? They need a lot of sun. And if you want a big, juicy beef steak tomato, you're going to need 8 to 10 hours of sun. Well, a lot of people don't have sun, especially here in North Carolina. In Oklahoma, we had more sun than we could stand. Oklahoma, no sun. I found out that cherry tomatoes will only have four hour sun requirement. You can grow them in, the, in, in a place where you get morning sun. So this is important when you're doing your plan to do this. You also want to do things like, all right, okra is really tall and it, and it shades. So you don't want to put tomatoes where okra is going to shade them. But you can put lettuce in the shade because lettuce is fine with that. There, so just keep those things in mind. The, you're gonna wanna know if it's, a, if it's a cool season, a warm season, or a cold season. Those are the three seasons, and Catherine will get into that. Um, now I need to leave that one. We're gonna spread it. <laughs> oh, all right. So she's gonna pull up an example of my spreadsheet and I'm gonna show you just a little bit about what I do with it. Sarah, can I ask you? Sure. Do you, in your 15 vegetable beds, <laughs> do you plant the same thing in that whole bed? I uh, sometimes do and sometimes don't. Okay. And one of the reasons for uh, tr changing them out is that if you have some sort of disease that's specific to that plant, um, changing them out starves out that disease a little bit. Okay. And another thing that's really good about rotating is I always try to put rotate my bean crop, any kind of a bean crop I rotate because they're nitrogen fixers. Right. So I always do that and I cut them off at the ground. I don't take the roots out. I let them leave the roots in. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> Give me one more minute. Okay, one more minute. Are there any questions what she's doing this? Yes. Tested every year? Every year. I would um, start with testing the first year, and once you kind of know what's going on with your testing, then you can back off to testing every two to three years. But it's really nice to kind of be developing a base understanding of what is going on with your soil, if that makes sense. So once you start kind of seeing what's going on, seeing how it works, you can back off that testing. But certainly the first year, do a good, strong test and kind of test a lot of things. Right, maybe test every bed individually. Um, and that's the extent of how much I can talk and stress about a computer at one time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Good job. We're, not, we're not testing right, or not pre-testing right now. We're not pre-testing right now, yeah. Uh, when do we start again? Is that in April? April 1st, we'll start pre-testing again, um, which will be great. And we always have supplies in the blue cabinet in the pre-testing period, which is April through Thanksgiving, we always have supplies in the blue
blue cabinet out there and you can drop your samples off in the blue cabinet, which is really nice um, because we will take them over to Raleigh for you. Yeah, just, so just keep that in mind. It's, it is easy to do and it, you'll get a wealth of information. Yeah. And you have master gardeners that will help you decipher that information also. <laughs> So this is my, um, two of my spreadsheets. This top spreadsheet right here is what I call my data dump. Anytime I get any information about any plant, it goes into this top spreadsheet. Um, and in this one, it's, it's divided into four sections. This first one is the plant. I've got my black beans. Then I have my days to germination, which is 10. So if they don't come up, and it's not 10 days, I'm not gonna sweat it. Then the next one is my weeks to harvest, and remember that that's from the time I transplant it to the time it, I take it out. And then the fourth section are my months, and I have down here one and three, uh, because, just because I wanted to squeeze them in. It's the week one, week two, week three, week four. I just put the first number there. So you can see here that on, in March, the third, second part of March, I'm going to plant them inside. That's the I. And then the third part of April, I'm gonna transplant them outside. And then these O's mean that if I got lazy and didn't do it, I can transplant them. I can plant them directly outside without starting them indoors. And then the H is when I'm gonna take the plant completely out of the bed. So the second spreadsheet right here is one that I create new every single year. And here's my black beans, indoors, month three, week three, in a tray. Then my black bean is transplanted, month four, week three, and then two. Then it's harvested in month six, week four, out of bed two. Then kale is planted outdoors in month eight, week three, into bed two. Now one of the things I like about this spreadsheet is that I can sort by the plant if I want to know how the plant is progressing through the garden. I can also sort here, which will give me a month to month way of knowing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is really good for me. And I can also see what's going on in each one of the beds by doing that. Now this one up here also has a column right here that I left off. And it's a column where I can go into this spreadsheet and I can X, I want to start this in the spring. I want to start this in the spring. Then I use a filter and I've got all of my plants that I'm going to buy from the, the seed stores. Okay. So where do I get all this? Oh, okay. Just on that other one, um, the two months in between when you cut off the mm -hmm. black beans and before you put in the kale. Right. So you don't do it in in this one, I did not do it. I left it, I left it the way it, it was. Now what you can do is you can plant things that are fast growing like radish or okay. that kind of thing. So yeah, that's a good point. The, the goal is to have plants, living roots in the ground year round. That's the goal. That's the way I do it. Now, there are different ways to do it, but that's the best way for me. I think, I, in my opinion, that is the best way. It continues to feed the soil biome. It also, when, it, when its roots are finally gone, it aerates the soil. It, it leaves uh, channels for air and water to get down in there. So you're just planting right around these? Yep, right around it. Um, I had struggled with Brussels sprouts for several years, and I finally, one year just did an experiment. And remember gardening is all about experimenting. And I had black beans, or no, I had pinto beans growing in a, a bed. And as they were drying on, you know, you have to let the beans dry on the, on the plant before you take them. So I planted Brussels sprouts right in the bed while those plants were still drying. I had the best Brussels sprouts um, harvest that I've ever had because they were in there with those beans. Okay, where do I get all this information? Well, other than being a plant nut, you know. Um, seed packets and catalogs are really good. I find that the catalogs uh, 
probably give you more information about the particular variety than the seed packets. Sometimes the, <clears throat> the information on the seed packets is just a little too general. So read your catalogs. We have the Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox up here that is a great resource, not only for plants to start from seeds, but from uh, several, uh, as a lot of plants. We have, what's that called? It's the Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. Let's see if I can point to it right there. And if you, if you Google that, it'll come up. You also have several planting calendars. Um, I think every county, Extension County, has a planting calendar. Uh, you can do internet searches on it. You can go back and look at your notes from last year. That, that is a great resource. But one of the better resources that I have found is a spreadsheet that, that uh, Catherine is going to show you. And on that note, are there any questions? Yes. And you can find that on the internet. Um, there's some, I, I don't give too much credence to companion planting. Uh, the only one that I really would stay away from is onions and beans. They don't seem to do well together. But most of the plants do just fine. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Catherine, who's going to talk a whole lot more about 